Brought to you by Wondrium. Known to the ancient Greeks as the Omphalos, or belly button of the world, the sanctuary of Apollo at Delphi was one of the most famous cultic centers in the Greek world. The Oracle of Delphi features prominently in ancient epics, poetry, and narrative, and the prophecies issued at the sanctuary shaped the course of not only Greek history, but that of the wider Mediterranean world. According to some ancient Greek writers, the Oracle of Delphi received her prophecies in a very specific way. In one ancient version of the story, told by the Sicilian historian Diodorus Siculus, long ago, when Delphi was still uninhabited, a shepherd noticed vapors rising from a crack in the earth. He also noticed that his goats, standing near the crack, started acting weird, making odd noises unlike normal goats, for the goats began to act like beings possessed. Approaching the crack to investigate himself, the shepherd suffered the same effect. His strange behavior drew the attention of the locals, who upon drawing close to location, became inspired as soon as they came near to the place. Some even toppled into the chasm during their trance. According to the story, the inhabitants of the region, in order to eliminate risks, decided to appoint one woman as prophetess for everyone, who would pronounce prophecies from the god Apollo. A tripod, an object symbolizing divine presence, was placed above the chasm and thus the oracle was founded. But are these stories of intoxicated goats and oracles rooted in historical reality or in ancient exaggeration? Today we'll explore the origins of the cult of Apollo at Delphi, its staggering rise to an international power, and the plausibility of the theory that the oracle was high on geochemical fumes. The Homeric Hymn to Apollo says that Apollo himself came down to Earth in search of a suitable place to found the first oracle for humans. After a long and difficult search that brought him across central Greece, he came to a place called Pitho. Located beneath the cloud-covered Mount Parnassus, it seemed to be a suitable place to found his oracle. Only one problem. The location was already occupied by other gods, like Gaia and Poseidon. It also happened to be guarded by a fearsome female snake called Python. Apollo fought and killed the snake, and so took control of the place, and his priestess became known as the Pythia, the same name given to his festival. The sanctuary of Delphi is situated dramatically on the foothills of Mount Parnassus. Today, the ruins are surrounded by towering limestone cliffs on three sides. To the south, the sanctuary overlooks the the Valley of Amphissa and the Gulf of Itia. In his epic novel, The Ethiopica, the writer Heliodorus describes the sanctuary as a priestly castle and compares it to a fortress or natural citadel, enfolding in the fond embrace of the foothills. If you visit it today, you'll probably be just as awestruck as these ancient visitors. It truly is a mesmerizing sight. The site was inhabited as early as the 16th century BCE, probably because of its defensible location as well as the high concentration of freshwater springs. Even in this early period, it probably was some sort of cultic center. Among the archaeological finds from this period were hundreds of stylized terracotta figurines and fragments of drinking vessels. However, archaeologists have not found substantial evidence for architecture, which suggests that these early cultic activities probably took place outdoors in the open air. It isn't until the 8th century BCE that there's clear evidence for the presence of a cult associated with Apollo specifically. Bronze tripods, and bronze figurines. Many of these dedications were made by individuals not from Delphi, which means pilgrims traveled from throughout mainland Greece, even as far away as the islands of Crete or Cyprus, to consult the oracle. The Delphic oracle even makes an appearance in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, both dating to around the 8th century. In the Iliad, Homer stresses the wealth of Delphi, and in the Odyssey, Agamemnon travels to Delphi to consult the oracle before setting out for Troy. It was around this time, during the mid-7th century, that the Greeks built the first stone temple there, which stood around for a hundred years until the 6th century when it was destroyed. Cities from throughout Greece raised money for a bigger and grander temple, so big that they needed to build a terrace wall to accommodate it. Visitors to the sanctuary transformed this terrace wall into an archive of their pilgrimages, inscribing dedications on it. Of the more than 800 inscriptions, the majority record the manumission of slaves, hoping that Apollo would protect their newfound freedom. This second temple to Apollo stood until about the 370s BCE, when an earthquake damaged the sanctuary. The Greek city-states once again raised the money and constructed a new temple that was completed in 330. It's this third temple that modern visitors to Delphi encounter today. 
It's interesting to hear about the Greek city-states banding together and raising money to rebuild the temples again and again. This points to one of the reasons why scholars call Delphi a pan-Hellenic sanctuary, a sanctuary recognized across the Greek world. And in fact, Greek city-states would donate to the sanctuary, and the donations would be stored in treasuries placed along the sacred procession to the temple. So imagine the social and political undertones for pilgrims visiting Delphi. You'd walk along that sacred road and pass by these lavish donations from the wealthiest and most powerful in the Greek world. Once you reached the temple itself, access was gained via a covered forecourt. Carved into the walls of this court were the phrases, know thyself and nothing in excess, the so-called Delphic maxims. The interior of the temple apparently was unique compared to other Greek temples because it contained a back room where the oracle resided, though it's not entirely clear where this might have been based on the archaeology of the building itself. Let's turn now to the oracle herself, the Pythia. As an intermediary between the god and the mortals who sought his guidance, the Delphic oracle was carefully selected from the local women of Delphi, or the surrounding area. One archaeologist hypothesizes that the oracle would have been chosen at a young age, and groomed for the position by the priesthood, kind of like how a new Dalai Lama is selected today by Tibetan Buddhists. As I just mentioned, the oracular process is believed to have taken place in the back room of the temple, which was divided into two rooms, a reception hall for those seeking to consult the Pythia, and an inner room called the Antron. After having purified themselves in the waters of the nearby spring and making the necessary offerings, the supplicants would enter the receiving room where they were attended by the priests of Apollo. Meanwhile, the Pythia waited below in the other room where she listened to supplicants' questions and issued her prophecies. Inside there, the oracle drank water from the spring, sat upon the tripod, which according to some of our sources was located either above or next to a chasm, chewed laurel leaves, and inhaled the vapors from the chasm. Then, having entered a trance like state, the Pythia is said to have communed with the god, pronouncing his will. Some of our sources say she sometimes spoke plainly without an intermediary, other times she spoke in complicated hexameter verse, other sources say it was the job of the priests, waiting along with the supplicants in the receiving hall, to interpret the proclamations of the oracle. Plutarch does mention one session where she became crazed and spoke inarticulately, but he seems to imply this was an unusual occurrence. But her prophecies were seldom easy to understand. For example, consider the divination given to Croesus, king of Lydia, who sought the guidance of the oracle on whether he should declare war on Cyrus, the king of Persia. The Pythia said, if Croesus should send an army against the Persians, he would destroy a great empire. Croesus took that as an affirmative, that he should go to war, and he went forth to confront Cyrus. However, his military campaign failed, and the mighty empire he destroyed was not that of Cyrus, but his own. These ambiguous answers given by the Pythia probably served to protect the reputation of the sanctuary. With several ways to interpret the prophecies, the Pythia could avoid any claims of error or falsehood. The error always lay not with this prophecy, but with how the supplicant had interpreted it. During the early stages of the sanctuary, prophecies were issued by a single oracle and only once a year. Later, with the sanctuary's rise in power and prominence, several oracles were needed to keep up with the demand. Plutarch, who himself was a priest of Apollo at Delphi, writes that there were as many as three Pythia, and the days on which they issued prophecies was expanded from one to nine, basically once a month apart from the three months in the winter when the god was said to be absent from Delphi. People would ask a huge range of questions, sometimes on their own behalf and other times on behalf of an entire city-state. Private individuals consulted the oracle about questions of business, marriage, or personal journeys. City-states were focused on issues concerning governance, the foundations of colonies, and war. According to one count, of the 615 surviving prophecies made by the Pythia, 130 were concerned with politics. Okay, so let's talk about what was happening in that inner chamber, the Antron. In Greek, this means cave, and was likely built to mimic the natural cave where the oracular process was carried out in the first period of the ancient cult before the Temple of Apollo was even constructed. According to some of our latest ancient sources, Strabo, Plutarch, and Diodorus Siculus, the most noticeable feature of this room was a crack in the Earth's surface, from which our sources say a vapor arose that put the oracle in a trance-like state. The ancient geographer Strabo says that the seat of the oracle is a cave that is hollowed out deep down in the Earth, from which rises breath that inspires a divine frenzy, and over the mouth is placed a high tripod, mounted which the Pythian priestess receives the breath and then utters oracles in both verse and prose. So notice here that her prophecies are not inarticulate ravings. 
Plutarch writes that the vapor, which he also calls a breath or pneuma, creates in souls an unaccustomed and unusual temperament, the peculiarity of which it's hard to describe with exactness. But he likens it to the effects of being drunk with wine. One theory suggests that Strabo, Plutarch, and others are describing some sort of intoxication from geochemical gases, that the oracle must have inhaled gaseous vapors rising to the surface, which then triggered visions and prophecies. This theory really took off after an investigation of Delphi conducted by a team of geologists in the year 2000, though this remains controversial among scholars to this day. See, Delphi is situated at the confluence of the African, Anatolian, and Eurasian tectonic plates, so the sanctuary sits nearby some pretty major fault lines. Soil samples from within and around the Temple of Apollo revealed that they contained trace amounts of hydrocarbon gases, such as carbon dioxide and methane, while the gas ethylene was found in the spring water of the Cairna Spring above Delphi, which was probably carried to the surface through fissures in the rock and dissolved in the spring waters of the surrounding area. The research team really latched onto the presence of ethylene as the most likely candidate to explain the oracles of Delphi. Ethylene is a sweet-smelling hydrocarbon gas with a fairly well-understood psychological tropic effect on humans. In fact, doctors used to use it in the early to mid 20th century as an anesthetic during surgery. The effects of ethylene have rapid onset, within 30 to 120 seconds, and they wear off within 5 to 15 minutes. The user remains conscious and is able to respond to questions and write answers, but it results in altered states of consciousness, altered speech patterns, and free association. In other words, the user's thought patterns do not obviously connect to the question that they were just posed. So the research team argued this seems to match our descriptions of the oracle. Her speech pattern changes, she remains conscious, and she can hear questions and answer them. And Plutarch mentions her room smelling sweet. They thus concluded that gaseous vapors containing narcotic hydrocarbons, particularly ethylene or possibly benzene, were carried to the surface through seismic activity, vapors which were then inhaled by the Pythia. This was sensational news at the time, even being reported by major outlets like the New York Times. So case closed, right? Well, as is usual in the world of archaeological scholarship, the debate continues. The findings by this team have not been universally accepted, and unfortunately, the rebuttals have not gotten nearly as much attention. Major studies conducted by Italian and Greek geologists a few years later in 2006 and 2008 called the earlier study into serious question. They confirmed that the limestone under Delphi is indeed very permeable, which would allow hydrocarbon gases to seep to the surface. They also detected microscopic seepage of carbon dioxide and methane, but these are not psychoactive unless someone is deprived of oxygen, which they hypothesized could have been achieved via burning oils or perfumes in an enclosed space. But they also found no evidence that the environment could have possibly produced enough ethylene to trigger the Pythia's hypothesized psychoactive episodes. The team wrote, high concentrations of ethylene are thermodynamically impossible and are unrealistic in non-volcanic areas. To make matters worse, both studies concluded that the original team probably misidentified one of the fault lines, which apparently does not run under the sanctuary after all, or even particularly nearby to the sanctuary. The 2006 study says that the Kerna Fault is actually hundreds of meters away, and the 2008 study concluded it doesn't exist at all, simply stating, there is no evidence of a Kerna Fault. So this map from the 2001 study, which I've seen circulate on Twitter just even a few weeks ago, is completely out of date, and it's incorrect to say that two fault lines crisscross directly under the temple. From my perspective, it's a shame that the initial paper got all the press, but not the follow-up papers. Here are the citations on screen for those of you who want to read them for yourself. In short, ethylene is probably not the answer. The historian Darren Layou, a professor at Queen's University in Ontario, eviscerates this theory in multiple publications. He points out one and only one site, the Cairna Spring, yielded any detectable ethylene at Delphi, showing concentrations of only 0.3 nanomoles per liter of water. To put this in context, he points out that an average classroom full of students will collectively exhale several thousand times this amount of ethylene into the classroom over the course of a one hour our lecture. Ethylene appears everywhere, from ripening bananas to gasoline to cigarette smoke, but you don't get high on ethylene every time you sit there in a classroom or smell a ripening banana, because ethylene needs to be in much higher concentrations to trigger any sort of hallucinogenic effects, around 20% concentration in the air. The amount of ethylene discovered at Delphi was not even close to these concentrations and would have needed to be much higher in antiquity, many thousand times higher than what the researchers measured. The original team in support 
support of the ethylene theory countered that the ethylene could have been higher in antiquity, we just can't tell because ethylene deteriorates over time, and that higher concentrations could have been achieved in a physically enclosed space or by using ritual tools like the tripod to concentrate it. But this raises another concern that ethylene in the air is explosive at these concentrations, which is why hospitals discontinued its use in the 1970s. No one wants fires or explosions in your operating room, or in your Greek temple for that matter. Layu responds, are we to believe that there was an 800-year gas leak in the Aditon that was never sparked by a lamp? So detractors of the ethylene theory have argued that we're stuck in the realm of untestable speculation. In order for this theory to be true, ethylene must have been present in much higher concentrations than the evidence currently shows, or even possibly could show, but not so high of a concentration that it would have resulted in regular explosions. They further criticize the original researchers for selectively using their ancient evidence fixating on passages from Plutarch that say the Pythia's room was sweet-smelling, which they say must have been ethylene, but ignoring the absence of the effects of long-term ethylene intoxication in our ancient sources. No mention of blue lips and skin, no mention of a bad aftertaste and frothy mucus. At the end of it all, academic shots are fired when they lambast the researchers for assembling spurious evidence and a fallacious argument to suggest that the mantic behavior of the Pythia resembled the behavior of an individual and intoxicated with ethylene. If we must put forth a geochemical explanation, then carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide paired with oxygen depletion is a little more plausible, based on the 2006 follow-up study that debunked the ethylene study. Another Greek religious site, this one located in Herapolis in modern-day Turkey, actually emits toxic levels of carbon dioxide from the ground. The so-called plutonion, aka Pluto's gate, was thought to be a passage to the underworld. Ancient authors like Strabo say that it was enough to instantly kill animals animals like sparrows, and that goats and bulls were sacrificed via asphyxiation by lowering them into the space. Priests would even enter the temple while holding their breath. Modern geological surveys have confirmed it's a very geologically active area, and that carbon dioxide rises to the surface in toxic levels. So we can speculate that similar geochemical circumstances existed in antiquity at Delphi that enough carbon dioxide was being emitted into the temple, not in fatal amounts like at the plutonion, but enough to cause some sort of intoxication. But even this theory does not offer a satisfactory explanation for how the oracles took place. Carbon dioxide intoxication does not really trigger ecstatic, mantic experiences in humans like ethylene, but rather much more mild narcotic effects like dizziness and confusion. Nor do our ancient sources mention anything that would make the oxygen depletion theory more plausible. There's no mention that they sealed the chamber or the oracle sat through long incubation periods that would enable the oxygen levels in the room to drop sufficiently. So what do we make of all of this evidence? When I first started working on this video, I thought it was going to be really straightforward. I thought that the original article on ethylene was the definitive article simply because I've seen it circulate so much, even finding its way into a recent New York Times bestseller. And I was going to try to summarize its findings in a short and simple video. But as I dug into the research, I discovered all of these rebuttal articles, composed by geologists, toxicologists, and ancient historians. And I'm now much less convinced by the geochemical gases theory. So what's my read on the situation? I personally agree with the ancient historian Jonathan Hall at the University of Chicago when he says that there's no good reason to doubt that the Pythia and her oracles involve some sort of trance. Trance possession is common in religious rituals performed all over the world. So the claim that the Pythia made her oracular pronouncements in a trance is not particularly extraordinary. But psychoactive geological gases are not necessarily the primary factor or a factor at all in achieving this trance. Now, let me be clear. Chemically induced pronouncements by ritual experts like shamans or prophets is not uncommon in the history of religion. One notable example is the use of ayahuasca among indigenous South American peoples. Ancient people were well aware of all sorts of mind-altering substances, like opiates. And one scholar theorizes that the Pythia used some sort of plant-based substance. Our sources say she chewed laurel leaves, which scholars typically assume refers to the bay laurel tree, aka sweet bay, an aromatic leaf commonly used in cooking with no psychoactive effects. But matching ancient Greek botanical terms to a specific genus and species is notoriously difficult, and some have floated the idea that the Greeks were not referring to the bay laurel, but rather oleander, a toxic plant that can cause a variety of symptoms when ingested, including excitement and agitation, tremors, seizures, and even death though this theory is not widely accepted. 
There are just as many examples of religious groups claiming to be possessed by spirits or gods without using hallucinogenic substances. Haitian vodou ceremonies, for example, include spirit possession rituals that primarily involve drumming and dancing. Some Pentecostal Christians practice glossolalia, or speaking in tongues, which appears to be a learned behavior rather than chemically induced. I think we could marshal hundreds of examples from the history of religion to argue that the Oracle of Delphi does not need a hallucinogenic explanation, and we could just as easily offer other explanations, such as a combination of light deprivation, incense, music, bodily techniques like hyperventilation, as other factors that might have contributed to the oracle achieving some sort of trance. If gaseous vapor was present, which is completely possible considering the geology of the region, we need not say it was making the Pythia high, but instead we could argue that ancient authors identified the vapor as the visible presence of the god, and inhaling it was one part of a broader ritual performance that involved much more than just inhalation. In this interpretation, the gas could have just been carbon dioxide. Plutarch uses the word pneuma to describe these emissions, which is a technical, philosophical, and metaphysical term in the ancient world to refer to divine substance. Medical philosophers believed that pneuma carried sensation through our nerves, throughout the body and brain. The Apostle Paul himself uses the term pneuma to describe the Holy Spirit. In these cases, they're referring to an invisible divine substance. Which leads to what I think is one of the ironies of the geochemical gas theory. It's based largely on a literalist interpretation of ancient texts. And as a historian myself, whether we're talking about a biblical text or an ancient Greek text, I'm not a fan of literalism. We need to read our sources critically. Historians like Hall and Leyu argue that the original geologists who championed the geochemical gas theory were making uncritical, literalist interpretations of our ancient sources and ignoring the more metaphysical and philosophical meanings of the words that Plutarch and others used to describe the oracle's trance. Dr. Leyu specifically criticizes them for interpreting Plutarch literally, the same guy who claimed to have personally experienced garlic nullifying the effects of magnets, and claimed that a remora attached to a ship could stop the vessel entirely, which suggests Plutarch might not be a credible eyewitness. Another example would be how Plutarch described the Pythia's room as wafting with a sweet-smelling breeze. The original team placed a lot of emphasis on this quotation, saying that this is evidence of a sweet-smelling gas like ethylene. But in the exact same text, he says that a hermit living by the Red Sea was so holy that when he talks, the place is filled with the sweetest perfume breathing from his mouth. So on one hand, we could read Plutarch's description of the oracle literally as evidence of a sweet-smelling gas, but from this, it seems to me just a poetic turn of phrase that Plutarch likes to use. Not to mention that if you're smelling ethylene, it's already too late, because at that threshold, it's at an explosive concentration in the air, so good luck. Which leads me to my second takeaway. This geochemical gas theory is based on underdetermined scientific data, data with too many unknowns and confounding factors to take this from the realm of untestable speculation to the realm of testable theory. I don't mind speculating. I think it would be extremely interesting to prove that the Pythia was inhaling hallucinogenic gases, but I need to be convinced it's the most likely theory. But as it stands, the theory leaves me asking more questions than it answers. Number one, the 2008 study says carbon dioxide and other gases would only be released episodically after earthquake faulting. How would the Pythia have functioned almost year-round with fluctuating gas emissions? Number two, why were the intoxicating effects only affecting her, since she shared the inner space with other people? And number three, what was the gas in the first place? If we are going to read that word pneuma literally as referring to a geological gas, supporters of this theory must posit what chemical compound, and how did this compound affect the human oracle? Ethylene or benzene are psychoactive, but they're extremely unlikely. The 2008 article that I cited earlier basically demolishes both of those possibilities. If not ethylene or benzene, then is carbon dioxide or methane or carbon monoxide more likely than entering a trance through the myriad of other ways that humans have entered trances throughout history? I remain very skeptical. These are gases that are only mildly narcotic in the absence of oxygen, but when narcosis sets in, they decrease awareness and increase unresponsiveness, not the sort of mantic behavior that our sources seem to suggest. So I would say the geochemical explanation is plausible, but my read on the current evidence leads me to believe that they are less likely than other explanations. The moral of the story here is practice good scholarship. 
read the follow-up studies, follow those footnotes to the most recent publications, and don't rest your argument on a single article from over 20 years ago. And speaking of good scholarship, I'd like to talk about today's sponsor, Wondrium. From the folks who brought you The Great Courses Plus, Wondrium is an educational platform where you can find long and short form videos, tutorials, documentaries, and more. What I especially like is how Wondrium offers entire series taught by real professional historians and archaeologists. So let's take Greek history as an example. In today's video we talked a lot about ancient Delphi, but we really didn't dive into the Pythian Games. These were huge Panhellenic Games held at Delphi, and they were kind of like the Olympic Games. Now, the Olympic Games are much more famous, but I feel like many people still don't really know how they functioned in antiquity. On Wondrium, you can check out the pilot episode of an upcoming series on the ancient Olympics. It's taught by Dr. Gregory Aldretti. He's a professor at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, which is particularly exciting for me because Dr. Aldretti's research hugely influenced my own PhD dissertation. This is just one of a bunch of other pilot episodes, including Mesopotamian creation stories, an intro to American Sign Language, and even learning how to track wildlife. Life. So there's something for everyone. If you'd like to give Wondrium a try and dive deep into some of these topics, Wondrium is offering a free trial for the Religion for Breakfast audience. Visit wondrium.com slash religion for breakfast or click on the link in the description below to start your free trial today. Thanks, Wondrium.